Our first efforts to understand the idea of extracorporeal circulation probably can be traced back to the late 1600s by a guy named Jean Baptiste. And what he did is he cross transfused the blood of a human with the gentle humors of a lamb. Realistic efforts to provide extracorporeal support began around the 1930s by a guy named Dr. John Gibbon, an effort that was primarily driven by a patient that he had with a pulmonary embolism. However, it wasn't until 1953 that extracorporeal bypass was actually used in the operating room to fix an atrial septal defect. In 1972, Dr. Hill placed the first extracorporeal life support outside of the operating room on a 24-year-old traumatic patient who had ARDS in the intensive care unit. In 1975, Dr. Bartlett placed a young dying baby from, that had meconium aspiration pneumonia on ECMO uh, for 72 hours and she survived. And now you can just imagine how happy the world is with this new technology. But things weren't always fantastic for ECMO. In fact, its history is a bit sinusoidal. In 1979, Zapoli came out with an NIH-sponsored trial that stated that ECMO does not work for adults. Further scrutiny of this trial revealed that all patients were placed on VA ECMO, not VV ECMO, for respiratory failure. The anticoagulation and hemorrhaging that occurred were primarily from primitive cannulation techniques and inadequate heparin management. The ventilator was kept at high pressure, high oxygen, including while the patient was on ECMO. And it took an average of 9.6 days on the ventilator before cannulation to ECMO occurred. The mortality was approximately 90%. In 1986, Gattinoni from Milan was the first to use lung protective strategies with ECMO, a concept that was well ahead of its time. He used a pressure control of about 35 and overall, he had a 49% survivability. In 1994, Morris did a study with 40 ARDS patients comparing mechanical ventilation and ECMO. There was a 42% survivability in the mechanical ventilation group versus a 33% survivability in the ECMO group. When you actually dissect the study out, it appears that there was a lot of inexperience. There was a lot of bleeding, a lot of circuit clotting, and patients were actually removed from the ECMO circuit and placed back on ventilator settings with extremely high mean airway pressures whenever they got hypoxic. And of course, this counted negatively toward the ECMO arm. The study did demonstrate that there were major limitations in using ECMO when there's very low flows, and that indeed higher flows are needed for oxygenation. In 1993, Dr. Bartlett was the first to describe adult ECMO and how case selection before irreversible lung injury occurs is a must. He had three major postulates in order for a good ECMO run. Number one was the fact that nutrition needed to be started and maintained. Number two, normal hematocrit needed to be maintained, and we'll talk more about that. And number three, lung rest needed to be maintained. All in all, his survivability was about 45%. In 2009, with the H1N1 influenza season, the Caesar trial came about, where a standard conventional ventilation modality versus transferring to an ECMO center was compared. There was a 63% survival benefit if you went to the ECMO center versus a 47% survival benefit if you were left on mechanical ventilation at a tertiary center. The biggest thing we took away from this trial was that having patients go to an ECMO center, where ECMO is done on a regular basis by intensivist, nursing, and ECMO specialist, is a must and definitely improves survivability. The greatest and latest in ECMO technology is the CardioHelp from McKay. It integrates three major components, the gas exchanger, the pump, and the heat exchanger into one single product. It is very easy to transfer the patient because it can be easily positioned on or under the bed. So we have gone from this to this. There are three main configurations that can be used for VV ECMO. Picture A shows blood being drained from the inferior vena cava into the ECMO circuit 
where it is oxygenated and CO2 is removed. This blood is then returned back through the inferior vena cava to the right atrium near the tricuspid valve so that the oxygen-rich blood can then circulate throughout the body. Picture B shows blood being drained from the inferior vena cava, but this time it is returned to the superior vena cava, again into the right atrium near the tricuspid valve. And picture C shows blood drained from the superior vena cava and returned back via the superior vena cava into the right atrium near the tricuspid valve. The indications and contraindications to ECMO. You know, clearly the inability to oxygenate and ventilate are an indication for ECMO. One common scoring system, the Murray score, um, can be used to aid in terms of who warrants ECMO support or not. And the Murray score is pretty much made up of the PF ratio, your chest x-ray, and how many quadrants are affected, how much PEEP you're currently on, and what your compliance is. And lastly, is, uh, in terms of an indication, is the disease process at hand must be completely reversible. In terms of contraindications, what we've noticed from um, our ECMO runs is that anyone who's been on the ventilator for greater than seven days uh, tends not to do well, along with those individuals that have had multi-organ dysfunctions. If there's any issues in terms of a contraindications to anticoagulation, for example, they've recently had an intracranial bleed, um, then this would be a contraindication to, to ECMO. Although intracranial bleeds can have clot stabilization uh, five to six days post-bleed. And lastly, anyone with an active malignancy uh, is a contraindication to ECMO. Here's an example of what the Murray score looks like. Any score greater than three warrants ECMO support. <laughs>